ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We're still continuing to cover the issue of good manners with Allah and today's focus is going to be on the value of his word and the value of his revelation and how does this apply in our life and how it reflects our utmost respect and good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam iqra' that was the first word of revelation read and the most unfortunate thing is our Ummah is very much way behind even reading and consuming what others have produced. Except in some few fields of necessity uh, like medicine and maybe pharmacy, maybe some engineering. Uh, other than that, we do not read out of the school curriculum. Whatever the school offers and we want that degree, we work hard to do it. We don't say it's difficult. We don't say it's a foreign language. We don't say it's a foreign environment. We don't say it's a foreign land, foreign culture. We venture and go in full force to get that paper, hang it on the wall and seek jobs with it. But the certificate that is going to get us to paradise, which is our own certifying of ourselves, when we certify and promise to be servants of Allah, when we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, that certificate we have not given enough reading, enough knowledge, enough attention. And that's why it is not paying off for us. It is not paying off for us because we have never deserved that high degree of honor of being actual servants of Allah. Our Ummah is way behind in practicing its deen. If you prayed Isha with us last night, and I raised the question, and you were answering, some of you, those who were here, and a brother raised his own question, which triggered the subject for today. And his question was, why don't we Muslims practice what we claim? Why don't we practice what we believe? Why don't we observe our faith even in dealing with each other, in treating each other, and in relating to each other, let alone any other rights to other people, but even within our community. And the answers we got from the rest of the crowd then, last night, revolved around either ignorance or lack of manners and etiquette or jealousy and envy that let people develop hatred and uh, be inappropriate with each other. So we need to reflect on that question. Why don't we act like Muslims? That's a central issue. Why don't we behave like Muslims? Whether you are a, a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, a child, a neighbor, 
a brother, a sister, or just a community member? Why is it that it is phenomenal in our community that we don't have the discipline that many other communities have succeeded both in inculcating those etiquettes in the lives and the hearts of their children at young age and they also have succeeded in making it the norm in their life taking turns respecting others following rules respecting science posted science respecting how we interact with others treating others from a place of value not a place of uh, resentment those basic values i believe are inculcated at young age children are taught both at home and at school to respect rules so when they go any place they look around what are the rules and they try to practice those in the environment in which they are why is it that you would see and i raised that issue last night why is it that you would see obviously children of other religious communities when they go to their places of worship the place is not turning into a playground or a jungle or a monkey bar place why and why is it that when our children come to the mosque they turn it into a jungle a playground and a trash bin why why even adults as we speak today who go out right outside the mosque here in the parking lot and they buy something from any of the vendors and they throw the trash on the ground while there are 10 or 20 trash bins available just a few yards away from them why why do we develop this culture of recklessness this culture of recklessness towards each other towards the environment in which we live i think is coming from the recklessness of our relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we don't observe allah how could we observe each other our needs our expectations and all of what makes a human community a pleasant community if we don't observe allah if we don't observe his majesty if we don't observe his rules without being pushed without being reminded like children then how could we expect each other to observe rules regarding each other in whatever relationship or else to observe rules regarding the environment in which we would be this mosque is the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we spoke before at length about the rules related to our presence in the masjid how clean we should uh, become before coming to the masjid how it is a sunnah from the life of the prophet to take a shower before you come to the Jum'ah prayer if you have not taken a shower uh, early in the Fajr time or in the daytime. So brothers and sisters, we need to observe the basic rules of human etiquette that makes the person respectful, decent, and a pleasant companion. This is how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ lived and treated each other. Their degree of love, care, and affection elevated their relationship to become as close as it can be to blood relationship. Now, we relegate our blood relationship into a relationship with enemies, not even friends. We don't care for parents as we should. We don't care for our children as we should. We don't pay attention to the needs of our spouses as we should. Even though we know it and we can list it and we can memorize it. But it takes a lot of screaming from one of us to get the attention of others that something is going on wrong. So I keep asking those questions and I keep coming to the same point. Values are indivisible. I'll repeat this. Values are indivisible. 
you cannot divide values meaning if you are a respectful person respect will become part of your character part of your attitude part of your daily practice you cannot say I respect X but I don't respect Y you have to offer respect for all even those who may not be as respectful to you as you expect if you treat them with respect one day they will recognize that they have to pay you back they have to reciprocate they have to turn favor and act with respect towards you and this is what the Quran says the Quran says you want to push back push back but just in a way that is better in a way that is better better than your friend better than your wife better than your husband better than anyone so if if we quit treating each other tit for tat if we quit being children saying I will not improve until he improves or until she improves if we quit looking at each other with disdain and disrespect maybe our behavior will change maybe our attitude will change maybe we can catch each other with better manners and change our community and change our society the Quran places a very heavy value that our values are absolute not relevant meaning that our values cover every aspect of our life the Prophet وسلم, says لا يكن أحدكم إمعا. let not any one of you be an arrogant or stupid idiot saying the Prophet وسلم, يقول إن أحسن الناس أحسنت وإن أساءوا أسأت ولكن وطدوا أنفسكم إن أحسن الناس أن تحسنوا وإن أساءوا أن تتجنبوا الإساءة حديث very beautiful don't you be like stupid idiots who follow anyone in any way saying to each other if people treat me well I will treat them well but if people treat me bad I will treat them bad the Prophet ﷺ's advice is he says train yourself and discipline yourself that if people treat you well you treat them well and if people treat you bad avoid bad treatment avoid bad treatment if you don't like it for yourself don't return favor because he wouldn't like it either and what happens is we escalate the conflict and we increase the animosity and we leave no room for reconciliation or proper relationship so Islam wants us every one of us to be the better companion the bigger head the bigger heart the more accommodating character the better personality the merciful source of mercy otherwise the community becomes a community of hatred and envy and animosity instead of a community of love the Prophet وسلم, in his best commendation in the Quran Allah tells him وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you but as mercy to the world the world of humans the world of animals the environment and there are so many examples time can never allow us but suffice it to mention a couple of those examples the Prophet وسلم, mentions to us a woman that was sent to hellfire because she caged a cat and did not provide it with food or drink until the cat passed away look at this a cat a cat can send you to hellfire what about a human what about nations that are starving full nations what about nations that are caging a whole nation 
and starving them to break their will and to get them to bow down to their occupiers or besieging power. What, what is this? What have we turned as humans? Are we becoming or have we become vicious animals? Both on the individual level, inside our family, in the society, and as nations. It seems that this has turned our world into a jungle. We have reached a point where might is right and right doesn't matter. We do not anymore respond to values. When somebody tells you, shame on you that you do this, we don't pay attention. It doesn't click as serious. Manners do not matter anymore. And the more you go deep into those issues, you find that it goes back to the value we place on Allah, on His Word, and even on our own Word. When we promise Allah to be Muslims, which means to live according to our commitment of submission to His will. But then we turn around and attack each other, assault each other, insult each other, harm each other. Why is this? Why do we harm the environment in which we live? The Prophet ﷺ said that even if you were making your wudu from a running river, what, how much water could it be more than a running river? And you're making wudu, he says, do not waste water. It is difficult to wrap one's head around this concept that how could you waste water while you are making wudu from a river? How much would you take from a river? But indeed we do. So protecting the environment and preserving the resources that Allah has given us, one should look at it from the perspective of the Prophet ﷺ. This river is not yours. It is for everybody around and even everybody coming after your generation. So in water, don't waste water. Time, don't waste time. The Prophet ﷺ says, إثنان مغبون فيهما نعمتان مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس There are two blessings that Allah has given man that many people are not doing justice to themselves in relationship to these two. What are those two? الصحة والفراغ Health and spare time. The time when you are not forced to be doing something, how to use it is a matter of appreciation. How to use your health before you become sick is a matter of appreciation. What is appreciation? Appreciation is the value you place on anything. When we say children need and have to appreciate their parents, and parents have to appreciate their children. It means what? Put them on a scale? Put them for sale to see how much they bring of money? No. It is to consider how much value they place on their parents and on their children and on their spouses and on their relatives and on their neighbors. This is what respect is. It is the value you place on somebody. And guess what? We are very good at respecting those that we have expectations from. We are very good, except the ones who deserve it the most. How many of us would go in the morning to their work and starting off by cursing at their boss? and expect to hold their job. I think it, the number is zero, unless one is insane. How many of us would venture to attack and assault 10 police officers who are surrounding his car and they are about to arrest him? You could try it, but how much could you win? 
So when we know that the person in front of us has certain power that he can exercise over us, we give them the utmost respect. So what happens? The value we place on their power is greater than the value we place on our own values. We don't value our own values even equal to a person who has power over us. If you need some money as a loan from someone, do you go to this person and start cursing and insulting? Or do you speak to them with respect? So we are capable of respecting everybody provided that we place the proper value on that person. And in Islam, every human being has one and the same value. Because he or she is the creation of Allah. That is their value. The essence of being a human. And why is this great? And why is it equal for every human being? Because if I value myself, I value you. And I value every human being. And why is this? Because we are all created from one and the same soul. خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ If I respect myself, I don't insult any other self because it's myself. And that's why, as I mentioned before, the Quran does not say don't kill each other. The Quran says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourself. When you kill a human being, you are killing yourself. When you hurt a human being, you are hurting yourself. But unfortunately, we developed the habit of carelessness, and unfortunately, it may reach the degree of recklessness. When we don't care about the consequences, we forget all rules, we forget all manners. And that's why the Quran spoke about this issue in a context. The Quran says, Nay, your problem is you love this hasty, immediate life. And you neglect and leave behind the hereafter. Meaning what? That the value you place on this life and what it has Despite the fact that the Quran called it the lower life, al haya al dunya, there is nothing below it as far as life is concerned. But yet, we give it more attention, we give it more respect, more time, more resources, and more effort, and we forget the hereafter. So when we forget the hereafter, it means we don't care about consequences. Imagine in your work that I'm giving examples of our daily life that may hit a chord. Imagine in your work if you forget that there is a paycheck coming every two weeks or every four weeks. If you think you're not going to be paid, how do you do your work? If you feel threatened, you may be dismissed or fired or terminated. What do you do? We have a mixed reaction. We'll have people who will change all their ways to make sure they are not terminated. And we'll have people who are reckless enough to say, hey, I'm not going to do anything. It's finished. They want to terminate me, let them terminate me. I'm not doing my job. Which one would you want to be? The reckless one or the one who gets the benefit of advice and the benefit of reflection that he heard that his company is going to dismiss him if he doesn't meet certain condition. If he's wise, he will heed the warning and change his way. The threat that comes to our fate with Allah is so serious and severe, عذاب أليم, عذاب شديد, but still, 
we tend to forget the hereafter and give attention to only this life. And again, why is this? It's basically because we are tangible physical beings and we feed that in us more than we feed the other side, the spiritual side of being a human being. When we feed our spirit, our relationship with the hereafter becomes stronger. And our motive for good behavior becomes stronger. And when we have the motive and the vision, our ways will be better. We are humans, and as such, we act and react based on two things. The value we place on the situation and the people involved and things involved, and the outcome. What do we expect the outcome to be? So when we feel secure, sometimes more secure than reality, we abuse each other. Like what happens between parents and children, children and parents, husbands and wives and vice versa. We abuse each other when we are secure. We know that my wife can do nothing. I can abuse, I will abuse. And that is not a good Muslim's behavior, nor is it a good character, because number one, it lacks the basic humanity, recognizing that your wife is a trust. Likewise, your husband is a trust. So when you abuse your trust, then you have to ask yourself, who entrusted this trust into your hands? When you married your wife or husband, what happens? You both commit to live according to the rules of Allah. When anyone abuses the other, it means they don't care about Allah. It means they don't value His words. And they don't value their commitment to His words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to value Him and to value His words. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد brothers and sisters you take this issue and you take the hadith of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in which he says إنما بعثت لأتمم مكارم الأخلاق I have not been sent but to complete and perfect your manners this is the ultimate purpose it's a matter of manners it's a matter of appreciation do you know why did many disbelievers deny the message it's out of arrogance it's lack of manners and the Quran cites this as a reason. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ And they did not reflect any appreciation for Allah when they said, we're denying this because we believe Allah never sent any message to any human being. They want Allah to act their way. What is their way? They bring excuses. They say, why didn't Allah send angels to come with him? Why didn't Allah pick him up, give him a full book all at once, and he brings it down to us? Then we may look at it and we may believe. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers all those false excuses and false claims by saying that had Allah known that this would have made them believe, He would have done it. But He knows that they are coming up with flimsy, unrealistic, disrespectful excuses for their disbelief. It is arrogance. It is arrogance that drives us also humans 
to either deny the message totally, as in the case of disbelievers, or to deny it partly by claiming to believe in it and not practicing it. When we don't practice our faith, our faith becomes nothing but a claim. It is not real faith. And that's why the Quran spoke about useless faith. Have you heard of useless faith? There is such a thing as useless faith. This is the faith that we claim and do not make good on our commitment to that faith. يَوْمَ يَأْتِي أَمْرُ رَبِّكْ لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا When Allah decrees his matter, no soul will benefit from its faith, except in one of two cases. If it has believed before death, and there was no chance to deliver on that promise. So a person who believed, and the same night he went dead, he didn't have enough chance to show his faith in action. That's one. Or else the person who has believed and was given a chance to live and prove, then this person will be evaluated based on how much good he made on his commitment. يَوْمَ يَأْتِ أَمْ رَبِّكَ لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ آمَنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ Pharaoh believed and he pronounced the shahada but only when he was under water. Only when he was under water. That faith is not helpful. That kind of faith is not helpful. Likewise, a person who believes, but he does not do anything good out of his faith. His faith did not turn him into a motivated Muslim, motivated by his belief. So his manners didn't matter. His relationships didn't matter. The way he treats Allah didn't matter. The way he responds or ignores Allah's call didn't matter. The Prophet and his guidance, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't matter to him or her. Then this faith is described in the Quran as useless. It has no use. It has no use. So we have to always keep asking ourselves. And this is the essence of what Umar ibn Khattab used to say. Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourself to account before you are held to account. وَزِنُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُوزَنَ عَلَيْكُمْ Weigh your deeds before they are weighed for you on the Day of Judgment. There is no false excuses on the Day of Judgment. In fact, no one will be able to speak at all except the ones who speak truth and only by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala لا يتكلمون الا من اذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا you have to have allah's permission and you have to speak nothing but truth and to speak nothing but truth your tongue may not be as functional and talkative and vocal as the rest of your body your hands will be witnesses your legs will be witnesses, everything in your body will be witnesses, and even the place on earth where you disobey Allah will also be a witness against you. So we have to live as Muslims, which means to live with our conscience, a living and lively conscience, not to live casually. We are living a casual life. We need to change and live a deliberate life. A life in which we deliberate with Allah, with ourselves, with our angels who accompany us as to what they are putting in our record out of what we're doing, which is 100%. So we have to be careful. When we ask Allah to forgive us, 
He is open and He does forgive. And when we make a promise to do better, He gives us a new page to write on it whatever we want. It's your new page. From every Friday to the following Friday, Allah opens a new page for you. Do you recognize this? Every day the sun rises, you are given a new page. Do you remember that? When you wake up in the morning, it's a new page. Do we live this deliberate life in which we think about the context in which we live? We live in two contexts. The place in which we live and the time in which we live. But added to this is that we are living by other contexts. The context of our knowledge, what do we read and what do we learn and what do we absorb of what we read and the other context by which we live is the context of our will as humans. How much willful we are, how much strong will we develop to do what is right and to avoid what is wrong. That will is missing. The will to live rightly and to live righteously, the will to stand for what is right is what we're missing. And the other context by which we live is the casual context, which is no frame, no recognition of place or time, no recognition of environment or surrounding, no recognition of rights and duties and responsibilities, no recognition of consequences and repercussions, as if we are, unfortunately, like living in a jungle of animals, not in a human community, where consequences do matter. When your word can turn a peaceful community into warring parties, it can turn a peaceful family into a broken family. It can turn a good, pleasant relationship into a miserable life. Just your word. Why don't we pay attention? Because we decided deliberately or undeliberately to live a casual life. What is a casual life? A casual life is what we call in Arabic كل شنكان. Everything goes. Why did you do this, brother? Well, I did it. That's a casual life. Why did you hurt your husband, sister? Why did you tell him this? This is inappropriate. Well, because he did this and he did this. So we adults become like children, tit for tat. That is a casual life. It is a life of people who do not recognize consequences, do not recognize the harm they are bringing to themselves and to their loved ones. This should not be the life of a Muslim. But the key to change this is to start off by showing and exhibiting good manners with Allah and his prophet and his book first, then everything else falls in place. So going back, the first word that may change our life around is the word iqra, read. I remember Moshe Dayan, the former late uh, Minister of Defense of Israel, saying when asked about how much does he fear the Arabs and the Muslims for the future of Israel, he says so long as they violate their book which says read and they never read, I am safe. My nation is safe. Inshallah, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, ICNA uh, Helping Hand, which is the relief arm, uh, and Dar al Hijra are hosting an orphan drive. They do serve 19 nations and their orphans around the world. And they are asking for your help. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us help helping hands of ICNA to do their mission. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا 
وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا غائبا إلا سالما رددته ولا مظلوما إلا نصرته ولا طاغية إلا قصمته ولا مجاهدا إلا أعنته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته اللهم ارفع الهم والغم عن بلاد المسلمين اللهم اكشف الهم والغم عن بلاد المسلمين اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم يا عزيز يا جبار يا مكور الليل على النهار اللهم إنا نجعلك في نحور الجبارين وفي نحور الطغاة المعتدين اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى من يد الطغاة المعتدين اللهم قرب يوما يا أم المسلمين فيه المسجد الأقصى آمنين غير خائفين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين ووالدينا ومشايخنا مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وأقم الصلاة